Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a guest, an Armenian composer, a musician, Joseph Bohigian is with me. Uh, Joseph, so tell me a little bit about uh, what you've been doing recently. I know you were in Armenia and uh, tell me about that experience. And we'll also get into some of the work that you've been doing there. Yeah, so I, I moved to Armenia back in October of 2019. I was there for nine months working on a couple of different composition projects. Uh, and I went there actually to mostly work on my dissertation, which I finished uh, back in the fall. So the main project was a piece that was exploring representations of exile uh, in Armenian music and the ways that my music as a composer, like and specifically as an Armenian American composer would be influenced by Armenian music. So sort of like trying to figure things out like that. So I wanted to go to Armenia to actually experience the culture there, hear the music there, because I had only been there once before for about three weeks. So I wanted to actually live there and have that sort of more like day-to-day -day lived experience. Well, uh, the piece that is a recent piece for you and you composed it in, while in Armenia, it's called The Water Has Found Its Crack. Tell me a little bit about the piece, the instrumentation, how it all came together and the story behind it. And, and did you compose that piece during your time in Armenia or did it start off in, in the US? Yeah, so it mostly started in Armenia. I did a little bit of research before I left. I actually, before I left, I was in Fresno with my family where I grew up and I went to visit the Armenian oud player, Richard Hagopian, uh, who lives in the area and who like plays at all the Armenian events in the area. So I went and spoke to him actually a little bit about the kind of music that he plays, the Ottoman, uh, influenced music because I knew it would be different than the music I'd be hearing in Armenia. But I mostly started the composition project when I got there. And the title of The Water Has Found Its Crack is a reference to a story told by Hurant Dink, the Turkish Armenian journalist and activist. And it's about a French Armenian woman who regularly took visits to Turkey to visit the village where she grew up. And on one of those visits, she died. And so they were trying to find her relatives to figure out what to do with the body for the burial. And a man from the village said, uh, let her be buried here. The water has found its crack. As in she is being like returned to the land. So that was something that really resonated with me, that idea of return. And it was something, of course, I was thinking about a lot when I went to Armenia. What does it mean to return to the homeland and the fact that I'm going to the Republic of Armenia, which is Eastern Armenia, but my family is from Western Armenia. And what do those differences mean? So trying to like work through those issues. Uh, so I did a lot of research for this piece at the Komitas Museum Institute in Yerevan. I was working there doing some translations of folk songs and editing of articles and things like that. So that's where I got the text for the piece. So uh, it's for three sopranos percussion, violin, viola, and cello. And I sort of created a text from fragments of folk song lyrics, put them together and created a new, a new composite text out of that. So since you mentioned the Komitas Museum, tell me a little bit about that, because I know that the building is fairly new. And I think the architect was Artur Meshian, but tell me a little bit about what the actual work of the museum is. Sure. So the museum is relatively new. I think it's maybe six or seven years old at this point. And it's dedicated to the work of uh, the composer, musicologist, and priest, Komitas. So for those who don't know, he's sort of the father of Armenian music, lived in the late 19th, early 20th century, and did a lot of collecting of Armenian folk music and established a tradition of Armenian classical music that a lot of 20th century Armenian composers drew on. So the museum is mostly dedicated to his work, has his manuscripts, uh, things from his life, art that's uh, depicting him like paintings and sculptures and things like that. And they also have temporary exhibits. Like I think when I was there, they had an exhibit of his students and the work that they produced. So that's the museum side and there's also a research institute attached to it and that's mostly where I was working and they published books like recently when I was there they published a book of a collection of the songs that Komitas uh, gathered and transcribed so I was working on as I mentioned the English translation for some of those song lyrics and they, they published scholarly uh, articles and books and things like that about Armenian music wow. they have an educational component as well. 
So your family is from Western Armenia. You grew up in Fresno. And for those who know about maybe American literature would uh, know the, uh, the great Armenian American, William Saroyan, who is from Fresno. And there's actually even a concert hall uh, in Fresno named uh, in honor of him. Uh, but I, there are many other great Armenians, including yourself, who, who, uh, who are from Fresno. How are you so interested in the Armenian uh, life and the, your Armenian identity, because someone who has for generations not lived in Armenia, your ancestors, you know, are from Western Armenia, but that's been a couple of generations now. And now you grew up in Fresno and reading your bio, I would think you're, you know, you're from Armenia or something because you're, you're <laughs> so involved in, you know, not only uh, you're inspired by Armenian uh, music and the Armenian culture, but a lot of the things that you're doing is very uh, connected with the Armenian identity. How is that the parents that, you know, you grew up in with, in the family where, you know, you talked a lot about Armenia and you grew up in, in that environment? Is it the community or is it a combination of everything? Just a little bit about your passion for Armenia. Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned the concert hall named after Soraya and I performed at that hall several times when I was uh, performing with orchestras when I was younger. Um, so a lot of the ways that Armenian music and culture influenced my work was a conscious choice that I made in the past five to 10 years. When I grew up, I went to the Armenian church every week. We went to Armenian social events, like uh, picnics and things like that. Uh, but it wasn't something I necessarily thought about. It was just like part of growing up, like we had Armenian friends and things like that, went to summer camps. So it wasn't something I necessarily thought consciously about all the time. Uh, I think it was mostly after my first trip to Armenia in 2012, I went for a three week music program through the Armenian General Benevolent Union. And I got to actually study Armenian music. I composed a piece there using some folk song material, got to perform it at the Aram uh, Khachaturian House Museum and their concert hall there. And that really started me off on a path of both incorporating my Armenian heritage into my work with music and just personally like looking more into my Armenian heritage and doing things like taking language classes. I ended up getting a minor in Armenian studies when I went to Fresno State because uh, I, I spoke no Armenian growing up. Like my parents don't speak at all. My grandparents spoke a very little bit and it was my great grandparents generation that came to the US. So I had to sort of relearn a lot of those things that uh, were lost just through assimilation yeah. over several generations. That's amazing. That's that's really that it kind of reminds me of uh, the story of uh, Dr. Hobanisian uh, and his son Rafi Hobanisian, who now lives in Armenia. I think Richard Hobanisian grew up in a, in a similar environment. I think he's actually from Fresno, and I think he had a similar experience where his family didn't really talk about it. But then he went on to be this great scholar or, or historian who uh, imp started a program of Armenian studies uh, on at a college level and wrote books about. About Armenia. So it's really, really inspiring to see that the, this type of, you know, it almost feels like the ancestral call or something within someone to, to go that route of really um, uh, exploring their ancestral culture and language and music and all of this. It's really great. I do want to ask you about a piece that you wrote. Uh, and I think, again, you wrote this in Armenia, possibly. It's called Khazari uh, Yerashtutsun. Talk a little bit about that and also. Uh, for those who don't know, what's Khazet? Yeah, so uh, Khaz is a reference to the old Armenian music notation system. So it was mostly used for uh, like vocal music as an aid to an oral tradition of how to sing. So it'd be the, like Khaz nooms or symbols would be placed generally above a text. So they tell you what kind of figure you're supposed to sing along with that text. And so a lot of the knowledge about the Chaz system has been lost uh, since it stopped really being used, I think around the 19th century. And Komitas, who we were talking about earlier, did a lot of research into the Chaz system, but a lot of that research was lost uh, during the genocide. Uh, and there are some uh, 20th century and scholars that have done some research into Chaz, especially people like uh, Robert Atayan. Uh, so I read some of those works to try to figure out like what's known about the system, what isn't. 
And it was kind of hard to figure out exactly what the things mean. So what I chose to do is take those symbols and reinterpret them as a graphic score. So sort of taking these ancient musical notations and putting them in a 20th, 21st century context and also in like a contemporary classical context because I'm also coming from that tradition. So I put the symbols on a staff and then it's, it's for string player. So for this first performance, I was working with a violinist and she would have to uh, interpret the shape of the symbol with her gesture of how she was playing the violin. So it's sort of taking this old element of Armenian culture that we don't know everything about now and putting it in a new context and seeing what can come out of that. And for those who don't know, uh, you you said a few things that uh, you know someone might have an idea about the graphic score. But what 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 is the graphic score for those who don't know? Because I I know uh, I get messages uh, sometimes from people who listen to this podcast and that are not musicians. And I always say this: my brother, who's not a musician, listens to all the shows I've ever done. <laughs> so a little bit about the graphic score. Sure. So. Uh, most of the listeners will probably be familiar with traditional music notation, Western music notation. So notes on a staff. Graphic notation is using other kinds of symbols to that are then interpreted by the performer, but it's not using a standard notation system. So you sort of have to make up the rules for the piece, basically. So there's a lot of like notes to the performer of how to read these symbols, what they mean. And in a lot of graphic pieces, there's a lot of interpretation that's left up to the performer. So in this piece that I wrote, I have specific techniques that the player is supposed to use. And the thickness of the symbols tells them about dynamics and the shape tells them about what kind of gestures to do. But then I leave a lot of, a lot of other things up to the performer. So it's up to them to decide some other things. So it's just in a lot of ways, a more indeterminate form of notation. Which makes it interesting because uh, someone who experiences your piece the first time and listens to it again the second time, whether it's the same performer or a different performer, might most likely will have a different experience with the piece and the sound uh, and the music in general. So it's a good way to uh, bring new life to the piece with new performers and uh, in general. Uh, any piece really the second time whether it's the same performer or a different performer you could tell it's different experience from an audience perspective but especially with a piece like that you really get a new kind of a perspective on it a little bit about your your recent award I think you were awarded uh, a prize recently at your college which you just recently got a PhD from right yes uh, a little bit about that and also uh, your work for your PhD Sure. So I, I think this is the SUNY PAC uh, yes. we're yes. talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went to grad school at Stony Brook University on Long Island in New York State. So as you mentioned, I just finished my PhD there back in December of 2020. And in 2017, one of my colleagues in the composition program, Nilfar mm -hmm. Nobash, uh, started a, she had this idea to start a laptop ensemble. So for whenever I tell this to people who aren't musicians or even people who are musicians, they get really confused about what that means. So basically we were mus using our laptops to make music. So we use different computer programs, like mostly we've been using Max MSP, mm -hmm. but you can use other things and you're making sounds with the computer. Uh, so when I started with that group, I had basically no experience with electronic music and absolutely no experience with live electronic music. And so it was just something interesting to try out uh, and we sort of, we grew over the next years, we became into more of a uh, solid group that did a lot of performances. And when I moved to Armenia back in fall of 2019, I left the group because I was out of the country. I couldn't really join them anymore. Uh, and then when the pandemic started in spring of uh, 2020, they decided to start meeting online. Uh, because nobody could leave their houses. So there were a couple of us who actually were out of the country at the time who were in the group the year before. So they contacted us and said, do you want to join again? So we all said yes. So we started meeting and figuring out ways that we could perform together online, uh, which was an interesting experience, which maybe we can talk about more after this. But we decided to apply to some grants and we ended up getting this SUNY PAC prize, uh, which we found out about, I think, like a month or two ago, which is really exciting. So we're going to be uh, commissioning music from 
faculty composers and student composers from five State University of New York schools. So they'll be writing us music over the next semester and into the summer. And then in the fall, as long as we can travel, we're going to be doing a tour across New York State and performing at all of those schools and also in New York City. So we're really excited to be commissioning and performing all these new works. Tell me a little bit about the experience, since you mentioned the experience of working online, especially in that format, but because that format is actually work, would work well online, you know, if you're doing electronic music, that seems almost like an ideal place to be because, you know, I conduct orchestras and this online format is really not, not doing anything for us. A little bit about the experience of putting that together and how do you, if, if it's a laptop orchestra or a laptop ensemble, how do you, where do you start? How does the process go? As you mentioned, even musicians sometimes don't know what that means. Where do you even start with an ensemble like that? Yeah, we've, we've actually, it's funny, we've even expanded to be, we're saying like more than just a laptop ensemble. We're doing anything that involves technology is in our domain. So it's even sometimes becoming like harder to explain. So we're basically anything with music and tech, we'll do it. And we're all very adventurous. Uh, of the six people in the group, five of us are composers and three of us are percussionists who like always like to do crazy things. So I was sort of lucky that I was playing with this group during the pandemic because the past year, even though I've been stuck at home for most of it, I've been doing the most performing that I've done like for the past five years. Because as I started doing more and more composing, I was doing less performing. Uh, but as you're mentioning, this is sort of the ideal situation to be performing uh, when we're all stuck at home. So we sort of connect over Zoom and we're using still programs like Max MSP, like I mentioned before, but we have to deal with things like lag and like just because we're all in different locations. So we're trying to build that into the performance. Like I wrote a piece recently where that's part of the piece uh, where everyone's not going to be lining up rhythmically and I don't want everybody to line up rhythmically. So that's like the intention. Or we have pieces even where we're all playing acoustic instruments and we're watching a metronome, but because of the lag for each of our different videos, the metronomes don't line up. So then the audio doesn't line up. So it gets a nice sort of ripply effect in the tempo. So we're trying to find ways to build in like the situation that we're all dealing with and make something unique that can't necessarily be just reproduced in a live concert hall performance. And with electronic music and performances like this, and the first time I experienced a laptop ensemble, I think they called it orchestra uh, at Cal State Long Beach, actually. Based on what I've heard, uh, you have to have, of course, some of the uh, sounds and ideas in your instrument in the laptop, but you could. there's also space for doing more in a live performance. A little bit about that, what you have recorded and when it's live performance, what do you actually end up doing and how much control and changes can you make during the actual performance? Yeah, I, so I'll, I'll give some examples of uh, pieces that we've done to talk about that. Like the first piece I wrote for our group, I it, it was about uh, Hood on Dink and like the protest marches uh, after he was assassinated in 2007. So I found just YouTube videos of those protests and I sampled some of the chants and I broke them up by syllables. And I found some other protests that were related. Like I got one from Armenia, I got one that was in Kurdish and one that was in English. And then I attached some of those samples to different keys on the keyboard. And the score was just a text that you type and a rhythm and a tempo. And then that's the piece is like, it's like a crowd sound, but you, you're getting the different samples sounds based on which keys you're typing. Or sometimes I'll take samples of different kinds of music and then we can like in one piece, we attach them to motion sensors and the motion sensors did different processing and like cutting up of the samples. Um, but we also have things like you mentioned where we're incorporating live elements. Like sometimes we sing and then the computer picks on of our and then it does electronic processing and then it comes back out the speaker uh sort of like electronified or whatever like so get, getting some electronic sounds from our live sounds so there's different combinations that we can do and i mentioned even now we're doing playing live instruments 
but then it's going through the computer and the different things with technological communication like is the tech part of it a little bit about your your start in music and you know i don't like to start the program as i mentioned early on in your career but i like to always go back and see where the inspiration came from a little bit about your background in music are your parents musicians do you have musicians in the family how how, how were you inspired to get on this journey of being a musician yeah so no one in my immediate family is a musician they all i think played when they were young and then gave up so none of them are very musical uh, but I started playing piano when I was five. I, the story that I've been told is my parents decided to get a piano because they thought it would be nice to have one in the house and they decided, oh, we should probably get the kids some piano lessons. Uh, so I started playing at five and then I started percussion a few years later and that became my main instrument. And I was doing all sorts of different music. I was doing my classical piano, but then I was in a youth percussion group when we were playing like rock songs and we're playing a lot of jazz, doing a lot of improvising, which was very influential in the kind of music that I was doing just even recently. Um, and so I was doing those sort of things, joined the band and orchestra in junior high and high school, playing the jazz band. Uh, and then I really started composing toward the end of high school. And it was, I did a summer program uh, the summer before I started a university at Fresno State and it was on composing and we got to work directly with professional performers, which was really exciting. And that's how I decided, like, I want to do composition because uh, it was a, like a big rush to actually collaborate with performers and have them there to work with while I was working on the piece. Uh, so that's how I sort of found my way to composition. And so I still do a bit of performing on the side, but now my main thing is the composing and now the performing with live electronics. Wow. A lot of people who know about Armenian music history might, or Armenian composers might think about, you know, Aram Khachaturian, if it's, you know, if it's really the big international stage, people know about Tigran Mansurian, who are, who know about new music and current music might know about Tigran Mansurian. One of my favorite Armenian composers who I've talked about a number of times on this program is Avet Tertelian, and people might know him, but uh, those are all kind of Soviet composers, and although Tigran Mansurian is alive, he's still kind of from that, you know, a little bit older generation. Uh, based on your experiences in Armenia, especially from the past year, a little bit about the music scene in Armenia as, as, as someone who went there from the diaspora. What did you experience? How's the musical life there? And uh, what's, what's the future? Just, just from your perspective and your ideas about what you've seen there as far as the musical life in Armenia, especially post-Soviet now. Sure. Yeah. And I want to say too, I love Ava Terterion's music. I've heard you talk about him on the podcast before. I definitely think he should be performed a lot more. Uh, so when I was in Armenia, I was actually, when I was working on this project, I was uh, doing some lessons with Artur Avanesov. If you know him, he teaches at the conservatory in Yerevan. And he's a really great uh, composer and pianist. And I actually met him back in 2012 on my first trip to Armenia. So he's definitely one of the leading, like younger generation of composers in Armenia. Um, there aren't a ton of new music concerts in Armenia. Uh, of course, they, there's an organization called Quarter Tone, mm -hmm. and they do a festival every year called, I think, Crossroads New Music Festival. Uh, but it was supposed to be in April, and of course it got canceled, so I wasn't able to go to that. They just did it online recently, I think, in the past couple of weeks. Um, so there, there are some new music things happening with the younger generation. Uh, there's also like a, this has some different genres in it, but a electronic music festival. Uh, what is it called? I'll see if I remember the name, but I was, I was talking with the organizer, organizers about performing at it, but uh, ended up of course getting canceled as well because of uh, COVID. Um, so there are, there are some things happening there. There are also actually a lot of, uh, from what I can tell, a lot of Iranian composers who are coming from Iran to study at the conservatory in Yerevan. So that was interesting to see as well. Um, and I actually was a orchestra workshop at the Yerevan Conservatory when I was there. So I got to meet some of the younger generation of composers and work with them uh, on some sort of like weird live electronic music kind of stuff. Uh, so there are definitely a lot of interesting things happening in Armenia. And also, even I've been doing a lot of research into like younger Armenian diaspora composers as well. And 
I, I think it's interesting that not just in music, but a lot of younger Armenians who do creative things are really embracing their Armenian heritage in different ways that I think is really interesting and good to see. Yeah. And how was uh, your class teaching at the Yerevan uh, State Conservatory, named after Komitas, by the way, we talked about yes. Komitas <laughs> times. How, how was that experience? And is there the use of electronic music uh, in, in Yerevan? I mean, I uh, Artur Avanesov is great. I don't know if he does too much with electronic music, but uh, are there composers there that are using that medium to, you know, express themselves through music? Yeah, there are there are definitely people doing music with electronics. I'm not sure exactly how much they're doing, like the sort of experimental electronic music uh, kind of stuff that I've been doing. Um, I, so I actually, I spoke to Arthur about this and the laptop uh, ensemble that I started at the conservatory. It was only the second time that a group like that had been started in Armenia. Before that, there was the, the Tumo Center had an iPad orchestra. Mm-hmm. I think a few years ago, but this was the first time at the conservatory, at least that they'd have uh, any sort of like live electronics performance group. And all the students that I was working with there had never done anything like that. Um, So I hope there will be more kind of stuff like that. I hope the students that I worked with will find it interesting and continue with it in some way. Hopefully they'll find a way to take you back. Yeah, I'm hoping to be able to go back sometime this year, but it all depends on the COVID situation. Yeah, and lots happening in Armenia. And I haven't uh, talked about this on this podcast too too much. And also, I'm kind of slowly taking a break from the podcast because uh, during the past nine months or so, I did about 60 plus episodes. And it's been, you know, I've had, I've been doing the podcast for about three years uh, or more than three years, but it's been spaced out the pa- during the pandemic you know, I just went, you know, crazy. And I did so many episodes, I'm slowing it down a little bit. But there's a lot happening in Armenia and the region. And with the pandemic, it's it's really a crazy time in the world, hopefully things will uh, settle down the, the world of composition. This is a big question, but I still like to ask, what can we do as artists, as composers, as musicians, performers, to get more interest from people who are not um, musicians and composers to be interested in the type of work that we do? I know it's a big question, but I like to ask because I know many of us, at least on the surface level, think about some of these things um, occasionally. Yeah, I, of course, I'm biased in this, but I think we should be performing a lot more contemporary music uh, compared to the ratio of music that's a few centuries old and music that's being written now because I think a lot of people who don't have experience with classical music don't see it as something that's relevant to their life. And there are ways that definitely older music can be relevant to their life. But if you see like the same pieces being performed over and over again at every like symphony concert, it, I understand why people wouldn't necessarily be interested in going and because it seems like not something for them. And not not only performing contemporary music, but I think for composers to be really thinking about like how they engage with the world around them, like, and how does their music engage with the world around them? I have sort of shifted over the past few years in terms of writing absolute music that was just about the music and nothing else. And now for the past few years, I've just had everything I've written has been about like the initial idea was about something that wasn't musical that inspired me to write the piece even if it's not something that's like necessarily in your face obvious in the music itself I've really been trying to think about ways that I'm like I'm asking myself why am I writing this music and I really want to have a good answer for each of the pieces that I'm writing and Mm. not just like because I want to wow Uh, A question for for those who have been listening to the podcast, especially the past year or so, know that this one's coming up, uh, a life-changing moment. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this because I was listening to recent episodes episodes of the podcast. I think it's something recent, so I'm still working out exactly in which ways it'll be life-changing, but I think moving to Armenia last year is definitely a big life-changing moment for me. for our Armenians, especially being able to go back to Armenia after so many generations being removed and being able to reconnect with our culture after being separated from it was something that was really special. So I think that's something 
that I'll always carry with me for the rest of my life. And even musically, it's something that I'll always be thinking about when I'm writing future pieces. Like I have so many ideas of pieces involved with Armenian subjects that yeah. I'm going to be working on in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add before we end? I'm sure we could talk about Armenia and everything that you're doing for a long time, but anything else you want to add before we end? Uh, no, this was great. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much. That was Joseph Boy again on Let's Talk Off the Podium. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.